Hello, this is Nick Bianchi with Senior Sales and Marketing Specialist at Camere. Today we'll be hearing from Scott Moore, Camere's Coding Specialist, about formulating to meet VOC regulations for industrial coatings. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat window on the left, should be on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, if uh, you have any questions, we're going to answer those at the end of the presentation. And now we have Scott Moore to uh, begin the presentation. Good morning or afternoon, depending where you're at. Uh, first slide you're going to see is just a general outline of what I'm planning on talking about today. And so the types of coatings, OEM, AIM, VOCs, formulation process, options for meeting these, and some formulating and processing tips. OEM and AIM. OEM are original equipment manufacturer coatings, and as most everybody probably knows, AIM are architectural and industrial maintenance coatings. To date, there's, the, there's a trend to limit VOCs and HAPs in all of these, and HAPs are especially affected in the OEM market. Uh, AIM coatings have national and regional regulations, which sort of helps the process. Nationally, they cover pretty much the entire country, but there are locales such as South Coast and OTC, which has enacted stricter requirements for these coatings. OEM. Regulations aren't as clear here because they vary from state to state and from region to region within the state. Certain states regulate by total VOCs. Certain states regulate by HAPs and even, even weight percentage of HAPs on the solids of coating applied. What is a VOC, not a VOC? I'm sure everybody's sort of familiar with exempt solvents. There are acetone, VMC, which is dimethyl carbonate, TBAC, tertiary butyl acetate, PCBTF, which is paraclobenzyl trifluoride. It was commonly known years ago as Oxal 100. BTF, which is benzyl trifluoride, methyl acetate, propylene carbonate, and there are certain silicone fluids that are manufactured by Dow and a couple other people that also meet these requirements. These silicone fluids, because of their really uh, low odor, tend to be used a little bit more in trade sale products because they have solubility parameters similar to uh, mineral spirits. Most important thing to note is not all exempt solvents are accepted everywhere in the country. California is a prime example. What's accepted in the northern part of the state as an exempt solvent are accepted in South Coast for their regulations. The questions I always like to ask before I start a formulation project, is the coding going to be customer specific, mainly used by one customer at one plant or two plants in a certain region of the country, or is it for general industrial sale? Are you going to try and sell this nationally or across a great area of the country? Because that will drive the VSC regulations you've got to meet. Shop conditions, a very important aspect. What type of application equipment does the, in, does the customer have? What's his cleaning process? What are they painting? Does he have any uh, ability to cure coatings, baking, force drying, or does he just air dry? In some cases, a lot of people will air dry their coatings exterior, no matter what the weather conditions are. Lastly, desired performance characteristics. By that I mean, how does the uh, product perform in his shop and at the end customers? Does, is the end customer going to be satisfied with the performance of the product once he receives it? Of 
probably the first option for meeting any of these is going to be powder coatings. Uh, there are urethanes, epoxies, TGICs, and there are even hybrids now. Obviously, there are zero VOC or, or very near to it. The advantage of these things, they're very good for large production runs. They uh, store as non-flammables. The parts are ready to ship after bake. There's no real, after the bake system, there's no real wait until the parts can be packaged and uh, sent on their merry way. You usually average a nice two mil film build. Your incoming freight costs are diminished because you're not shipping in water and solvents. You have less, you need less room for storage and will give you, and these products do give you a very durable finish. And they've really become widely accepted and, and used in many, many applications. The drawbacks to someone who's not involved in using these products are the investment in cleaning and application equipment. Uh, cleaning, usually a five to seven stage phosphate cleaning process is needed and they can be applied in two ways. The first is by electrostatic spray and the second less common for weird parts is called fluidized bed. Basically you're dragging a warm part through it like an atomized uh, fog of these particles and enough of them stick to the uh, to the part and then the part is baked after that. You need controlled temperature storage for your powder. If it's stored in too hot a conditions, it'll block. It'll become useless. Another drawback is it takes a tremendous amount of energy to both cure the product and clean the parts before you uh, coat them. And in the past, although these, these concerns are being really overcome, was the exterior durability as far as UV uh, durability of these coatings was very limited to start with. There are a lot of new ones, tips coming on the market that offer lower cure. A lot more people are bonding. The resins and the metallics to give, give really nice looking metallic finishes. There are new texture finishes out there. And in building panels, these products can even be used as anti-graffiti or dry erase coatings. Two K urethanes. These are basically reaction of polyol with an isocyanate. Acrylic polyester, acrylic polyol, polyester polyol, or you can even make urethanes out of alkids, which are really nothing more than natural oil containing polyesters. VOC levels can be very low, less than one, and these systems are both water and solvent borne. The advantages, properly formulated, they can give you excellent film properties, very resilient. They can be air or force dried, so there, there are energy savings to be gleaned by only needing to force out at 160 degrees Fahrenheit versus 390 degrees for powder coating. Performance and cost are driven by your choice of, compo of components. If you use an alkyd and an aromatic isocyanate, you're going to get a very low cost coating, but it will not perform as well as an acrylic with an aliphatic isocyanate. Drawbacks. You really need pretty clean parts. They're not Urethanes are not known for their adhesion characteristics. The isocyanate hazard for people spraying the product onto your parts. You are really better off using a two-coat system with these things uh, with an epoxy, a 2K epoxy primer underneath them to get your best performance properties. Another, need to cons another concern is the application equipment. Some of these products are very, very short pot lines. And using mix at the gun technology is really a good idea to, to avoid creating excess waste. As I mentioned before, these coatings can be used as anti-graffiti or dry erase coatings. You need and a lot of the uh, 
dry erase coatings on the market today are 2K urethane systems. You have to make sure you use proper solvents. You can add UV and HELs to enhance the durability. And you have to make sure you balance your stoichiometric ratio. Usually you want a little bit higher isocyanate ratio, approximately 10%. Another thing to consider is your density, your cross-link density. And if you can find a uh, lower equivalent weight polyol or polyester, you get better cross-link density and better performance. Two K epoxies. Basically an epoxide group that reacts with amine, an amid, an acid. Some of the common ones are aliphatic epoxies, bisphenol A and Novolac. VOC possibilities, basically zero. And they're both water solvent based and a lot of new ones are 100% solids. Advantages, very good abrasion resistance, moisture resistance, corrosion resistance, tough, very tough films. They offer very good base coats and they're used a lot for flooring, bridge undercoats for exterior, in high corrosion atmospheres. Some of the drawbacks are bisphenol A is getting on everybody's sort of hit list as far as something that people are trying to eliminate. A lot of these products, especially the solvent born ones, are very exothermic when mixed. So it doesn't allow you to pre-mix much of the product even though you maybe have a longer pot life. They tend to have poor UV resistance, they'll yellow and they'll chalk when exposed to too much exterior. And in solvent-borne ones, you have induction times to deal with, which can be a real fit if you're in a production situation if someone forgets to mix the material up ahead of time because now you're going to have to wait to use it. These epoxies are great for uh, adhesives, 2K adhesives. They're also very commonly used in zinc-rich primers. An intermediate primer in between the zinc and a urethane top coat primers by themselves. I've always found that a lot of, in a lot of cases, if you have primers, you're going to have to split your uh, pigmentation. It allows you to keep your stoichiometric ratio where you'd like it to, uh, with a decent mix ratio between the components. Important thing, if you're going to recoat, is to recoat the full, full cure. They tend to get very, very hard, and you can have adhesion problems with top coats. Thread before flow coatings are another great area for these things, and with the new technology, 100% solid coatings are very, very advantageous to be used in flooring applications. <coughs> ETM emulsions. There's been an awful lot of work in the last 10 years put in by resin manufacturers into these type of systems. These systems can be acrylics, epoxies, vinyl acrylics, styrene acrylics, urethane acrylics. They're coming up with new ones all the time. VOC levels, you should be able to get less than one pound per gallon, water removed. Uh, in most cases, the VOC level is driven by the coalescent solvents that are needed to create a good film. Advantages, they're very low VOC, they're non-flammable. A lot of the resins around can be cross-linked with uh, melamine or urea formaldehyde resins and baked or forced dry to get improved properties. They will apply by conventional spray and they tend to be very low odor, which can be important for certain users if they're located close to residential or areas where, where solvent odors could be a problem. Drawbacks. You need to have your formulation set up properly to maintain your viscosity stability. The metal has to be pretty clean to use these products. They'll do a reasonable job over some oil and stuff, at least that's what they say, but you're better off the cleanest metal you can get. You want warm shop conditions.